It's called trophy hunting, the sport of hunting wild animals. Many campaigners claim it's pure evil, but could it actually be one of conservation's best hopes? Welcome to Round Table. Hello, I'm Martin Stanford. Hunters pay hefty prices to get a trophy animal, and some conservationists believe controlled hunting could benefit the survival of species. Trophy hunters kill for pleasure and adventure, but many of them say their main motive is to help conservation. Their main targets, usually the big five, lion, leopard, rhinoceros, elephant, and Cape buffalo. They'll typically pay tens of thousands of dollars for their hunting trips, taking away animal parts to display at home. In 2016, the Humane Society in the US said that American hunters imported more than 126,000 animal trophies a year. Today, many animal populations are falling sharply. Africa's lion population has declined by 42% over the past two decades, according to the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Some experts have argued that trophy hunting can play an important role in the conservation of African wildlife, if managed carefully, and provide a major income boost. So, is trophy hunting one of conservation's best hopes? Time to introduce our guests. Joining us at the round table is Mark Jones, Head of Policy at the Born Free Foundation, Rob York, an environmental commentator, and Charlie Jacoby, a hunter and presenter on YouTube's Field Sports channel. Mark, let's start with you. Is trophy hunting a good thing? Um, at Born Free, uh, we have an ethical objection to trophy hunting. We don't believe that there's a place in modern society for any uh, shooting and killing of animals for sport or pleasure. But we also uh, take issue with the claims made by hunting proponents that trophy hunting somehow provides uh, a, uh, benefits for wildlife conservation or local communities. Uh, the money generated by trophy hunting may look like a, a large sum uh, in and of itself, um, but actually uh, it, it uh, constitutes only a very, very tiny proportion of uh, tourism income in the countries in which uh, trophy hunting takes place. And uh, our uh, evidence shows that very little of that income ever really reaches conservation or local community programs. We think a completely new paradigm is required. Um, we'll, to, we'll get into some of the detail yeah. in a moment, but we're talking of the whole of sub-Saharan Africa here. Mm. That principle that you talk about can't necessarily apply in every single country, can it? Well, uh, trophy hunters and their proponents uh, do make arguments and they often use specific examples of perhaps con conservances. Namibia is often uh, used as an example where trophy hunting generates income that, uh, that helps to fuel the, the very localised economy of a conservancy. But we're looking at this across the piece. Wildlife uh, across Africa, including sub-Saharan Africa, is in, is in big trouble. Biodiversity is in, is in massive decline. Uh, and uh, we don't believe that killing animals for sport or allowing uh, wealthy uh, people from overseas to pay money to come and target what are often endangered and very crucial animals to the ecosystem uh, can play any uh, beneficial role in wildlife conservation. Let me turn to Charlie then to see if we can rebut that, if you want to, Charlie. Yes, uh, I would, if I may. I do think... you think there's any benefit? And what, how would you identify them for us? Well, I'd just like to pull out two things that Mark says. I think Mark's, Mark's essential problem is he, he, okay, he can be against hunting if he likes, but he's really against hunters. He doesn't like, he doesn't like me because I hunt. But hunting itself does provide enormous cons conservation benefits. It doesn't make much of a contribution to GDP, but I mean, neither does tennis in this country. Uh, it does make an enormous difference on the ground um, compared to photographic safaris. Unfortunately, photographic safaris just can't pay for wildlife. It's no coincidence that the wildlife winning countries of Southern Africa are the hunting countries that the Southern white rhino is not doing too badly. Uh, in those hunting countries, and yet the northern white rhino died out in the anti-hunting country of Kenya. Uh, and just to tease out one thought here, do you have to kill what you are hunting? As Could a, hun you, as a hunter. You, well, you, I'm just trying to understand the point. Is killing it 
the beast part of the deal, or could you just tranquilize it and still claim to have some kind of human versus animal skill? So this, so this, so this, is, the, this is the hunter question rather than the hunting question. And it's, this is a very tricky one because it's difficult to answer in a single soundbite. And I'm glad we've got a little bit of time here to talk about it. I'll try, OK? Uh, first of all, Mark's in a very good place because everybody agrees on his side of the argument that cute and fluffy animals are cute and fluffy. On the hunting side, we have enormous differences. So it's not culturally that British to go trophy hunting these days. It's very American. I mean, I know people who actually go to Africa from America to decorate their houses. Uh, and they don't understand the British habit of walking slowly towards pheasants, which is something, you know, something we do in this country. And then there's the Chinese. I've just been to China on a hunting trip over there. Uh, and they like to wound things because it keeps them fresh on the way to the kitchen, which we completely don't understand and the Americans thoroughly disagree with as well. So you see, it, consensus in global hunting is, is very difficult. If you want to talk about what it is for me personally about the hunt, uh, I tend to do more kind of management hunts. So I, uh, in this country, look after a deer forest and make sure the deer populations are, are what I believe is are healthy. And mine is a tiny little wood, and there's a huge omelet of woods all the way across the UK. And you have some people who want to preserve all the deer and some people who want to kill them all, and me who wants to kind of something in the middle. And, mm. and, and altogether, you get a balanced population. Africa, a completely different situation. It, there, the question is, it, it, does it pay? If it pays, it stays. One problem Mark will have to face is after Donald Trump banned trophy imports to the USA in 2014, the locals went out and said, well, these lions aren't worth anything anymore, so killed 200 of Cecil's relations in, in Zimbabwe by trapping, snaring, and poisoning. Not something the Americans or the Europeans or probably even the Chinese particularly agree with. So you know, again, you're sort of bumping into that problem point. Now, there's, a, there's, a, there's another bit, which is, the pulling of the trigger. So for me, it is a small part of a, a very large exercise. And so therefore, I would say, yes, I, I will do it. It is, as one friend of mine described it, 99% uh, elation, 1% horror. I mean, there is, there is a sort of mixture. And for some people, I would imagine, if Mark went hunting, he would describe it as 100% horror. I mean, I, I think that, mm -hmm. that is a, a fair, uh, fair way of looking at it. And then the final part is, the bringing of the trophy home, which is the thing that seems to really offend people, or even the taking of the photograph of the trophy animal with uh, the happy hunters, who either look kind of gloomy or smug, neither, neither of which particularly work. And, you, and you, have to, you have to, if you're looking at photographs of that, you have to think to yourself, these people have paid perhaps a quarter of a million pounds to do that. They believe they are conservation heroes for what they've done, because that money has gone straight yeah. back in. But, those who, but to those who oppose them, that makes them all the more revolting. Absolutely. But it's there in that instance, you know, out on the savannah in Africa, it's very difficult for them not to yeah. consider themselves like that. Let me give Rob York a chance to come in with a conversation here. Are you a hunter or are you a conserver? Well, I'm actually a hunter naturalist, uh, which is a term few people come across these days because this whole subject that we're talking about is... is uh, about animal rights, it's about, it's about animal welfare, it's about wildlife conservation, it's about ethics, it's about morals. It's such a big subject uh, that it's not easy to translate it to some of our day-to-day -day conversations. And that's because uh, trophy hunting, to use the phrase, other people call it conservation hunting, uh, and we're talking about Africa here, but a lot of the issues, you could translate them to the UK, to America, to Scandinavia, the hunting of animals uh, as part of conservation, and then you might hang part of it as a trophy afterwards. So there are lots of different issues interwoven uh, into that. But I think one of the important things that we do have to talk about as part of any land use, and hunting is a land use, are the local communities who are involved, especially in Africa. And that is a subject which is very rarely touched on because it quite frankly doesn't make the headlines. Well, and it's very tempting to generalize. But is there a generalization whereby you could say there is evidence that trophy hunting benefits local communities? I think there's is lots it as simple of, as that? Well, no, it's not as simple as that. There are elements of that that I'm sure Charlie would probably like to pick up on. My role, I feel here, and I, this is maybe slightly self-appointed, is that I want to find some common ground between Mark and Charlie. Yeah. So, you know, other people will be irritated by that, saying, is Rob going to jump? Are you with me or are you against me? Because if you're not with me, that means you're against me. And that's 
not right, because all of this are shades of gray. So trophy hunting uh, can benefit the local community if it's done bottom up rather than top down. Top Just down. Explain that for okay, me. so top down would be the kind of governance from uh, from the government who would have a concession for the hunting and then they would put it out to the open market and then it would just be the highest bidder, comes in, takes their right, muscles in, does their trophy hunting. Bottom up would be you give control of the process to the local communities who decide, not the highest bidder, it's who they want for a particular animal which has caused a problem, maybe an elephant coming for the water, a child might have been killed, they've tried to relocate it, they've tried to create another water source, translocating an elephant is more of an animal welfare issue, it's very bad news for the elephant, and possibly for it to be hunted, would be the decision by the local community. And I would apply that across the board to the UK. Some of the decisions about how shooting or hunting is undertaken needs to be curtailed. You see, Mark Jones, how do you um, understand or how do you rationalise the idea that some conservation programmes by veterinaries or other experts actually involve the killing of animals to control a population in, in a particular circumstance? Is that wrong in well, and of itself? Do you well, think? of course they do, and there are circumstances where that may be necessary, and our view would be that uh, one, one should uh, look at these programmes with a view to minimise the impact on the welfare of animals concerned, minimise the number of animals that you're having. But I'm sure you're familiar with the argument that sometimes it's for a, the animal's benefit. In order to achieve the, the outcome to, that, that, that has you to want to become smaller. But what, we're, what we've started to talk about here is funding. And uh, the claim of hunters is that they're motivated by, or uh, many hunters and hunting proponents, is that they're motivated uh, by conservation and, and uh, through the benefits that local communities accrue uh, because of hunting fees and so on. Mm. Um, but we've, we've done uh, research in, in Zambia, for example, uh, that shows that the, uh, that the um, money that's supposed to accrue to lo local communities through their community resource boards and through their local chiefdoms under Zambian law very rarely reaches them to any degree. Uh, trophy hunting actually employs a relatively small number of people. Um, yes, it generates a, a certain amount of money, but you've got to question where that money goes. And my, my question uh, to hunters who claim to be all about wildlife conservation is that um, uh, if you're going to pay out a, often quite a large amount of money for an individual to be paying in order to kill an animal, uh, ostensibly on the on the basis that you're interested in that money going into wildlife conservation or local communities, then you don't have to kill the animal to provide those benefits. You can donate that money to uh, re really no, good I projects that, that are going on in. in I'm just in wondering if, if you know veterinary surgeons or whoever were going to cull that animal or a number of that particular uh, beast in any way, does it matter if Charlie goes along and does it? For them. Well, I, I think there's, it's a, a very big mistake, uh, and this is something uh, that you mentioned, it's a very big mistake uh, to assume that hunters are there providing some kind of uh, service in order to remove problem animals or that they only target redundant animals. That's simply not the case. Trophy hunters don't target problem or redundant animals. Trophy hunters target animals that make good trophies because that's what motivates them. That's what they're interested in. There's some quite good psychological research uh, these days that, 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 that seem to show that that's the case. Um, and if you take some of these animals out, some of the often, you know, they might be the animals with the longest tusks or the darkest manes or whatever the particular mm. trait is that somebody's after. Uh, you don't only impact that particular animal. Trophy hunters aren't always good shots and they're not always targeting the part of the animal that will affect a clean kill because that might be an important part of the trophy. And they're often using antiquated methods to kill these animals like bows and arrows or, or muzzle loaders or, or handguns, which would never be allowed uh, as a method of killing livestock, for example, in most countries. But uh, if you assume that, uh, that but it's not only the animal that you're targeting that's affected, many of those animals have crucial roles within their families, within their societies. You mm. take out a big bull elephant, it may be at its reproductive prime, but it's also probably controlling and uh, managing other groups, uh, bachelor groups of elephants, which can become very problematic if you take that bull out. Are the rules, some countries have rules, don't they, about um, male animals should be protected or females should be protected, uh, and do hunters necessarily follow the local 
bylaws, if you like, or do they just do what the hell they like where, because they're and they've got a big gun? You're right. Where they don't, I am completely with Mark and I'm sure with Rob, that, sh that needs to be stopped. We're talking about regulated hunting here. Yeah. I disagree with Rob about this bottom-up. It's a lovely theory, bottom-up thing. At the moment, uh, for example, in Namibia, we have NAXO, which is the government-led community hunting operation. So money that goes into hunting also goes into NAXO, which goes into community projects and allows the locals to see the value of, but you know, the nature of these things as it is, it is a top down. And we have seen Campfire in Zimbabwe, which was a very good program, go through some significant problems. We're hoping now it's gonna become a very good program. And I would say Zambia is not a good example of uh, a country that practices regulated hunting. It practices hunting and some of it is regulated. But if you are a, a conservancy where people are coming to shoot as as tourist hunters, you need to manage your, your animals. Otherwise, you're going to have to continually go out and buy these animals. It is far better to keep your herd healthy uh, and, and going. And you can also, I should say, while you're there, you can also afford to manage herds of animals which you're not going to hunt, such as southern white rhino. And there are plenty of cases of southern white rhinos living in these sorts of conservancies. Yeah. Just respond to that if you'd like, Rob, and I'll talk about elephants in just a minute. Yeah, well, well I mean, I could talk about elephants now because that's um, a good example of where um the local community is um, is detecting an elephant which which is causing a problem but at the same time as charlie says there are uh let's say um some significantly important large animals that 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 the locals can manage it's not about the top-down money pulling the strings as to how they do it, it's still the actual governance is with the local people to, to actually undertake the trophy hunting. And sometimes they do it themselves. They don't always employ or take money in from uh, a big game hunter from elsewhere. They actually have a kind of trophy hunter who works, or sorry, a professional hunter, they would be called, yeah. working within the local community in order to, in order, um, to take out that, you know, to actually take out that animal. I, I was interested to read the example of Botswana, where they had a ban, didn't they, on, on shooting elephants? Yes, they did. And, and then the happened? new government came in, change of leadership, and they decided to lift that ban. The rationale was provided there was that the population had simply grown too big. Indeed. What happened right at the start was, uh, was the leaders uh, in Botswana were reacting to a Western press uh, and saying that we must ban all all, all hunting, actually, not just trophy hunting, local meat hunting. Right. Okay, so bush meat, as they call it, and that was all banned. And then, the, and then, as a result of that, uh, a lot of tensions were building up between humans and wildlife as the elephants came back. And then, at the same time, because there was no regulated hunting in the area, poaching started to. I mean, the elephant has the whole but, ivory question, I suppose, as well. well that's, I mean, that's still well, as valuable as ever, so. I think, on, on world markets, isn't it? How, yes. how do you manage the, a situation like the Botswana found themselves in with, with, a, with a, what they diagnosed to be too many elephants in the country? Well, I think, first of all, you have to um, understand that the change in, um, in the policy in Botswana is a, a change in policy as a result of a change in presidency. Um, I understand just, just that there, I understand that I, th I think there's a huge political dimension yeah. to this. Uh, I understand <clears throat> that there were maybe some disquiet within local communities about the ban on bush hunting for meat and so forth. Um, but when it comes to elephant populations and the numbers that the, uh, the new government in, in uh, Botswana it has, uh, uh, has suggested might be there, um, suggesting that these numbers have swelled enormously as a result of the ban which was in place for, for about four years, I think. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions about the numbers that they're using. They, they, they haven't been ind independently verified. Uh, and you've also got to see, you know, elephants are very mobile animals. They don't respect international borders. And they're well, highly sure. intelligent I mean, animals. And they will... Yeah. They wander all over mm -hmm. the place. Ab and absolutely. And they will, they will, you know, um, go to areas where they feel safer. Uh, and if there's no hunting in an area that might be an area an area where elephants identify as being more safe so uh, you could look at Botswana and say well you know Botswana is in effect taking us down to the lowest common denominator by by uh, removing its hunting ban what are we trying to do here are we trying to manage these elephant populations in a state of constant fear uh, what we ought to be doing is trying to encourage the surrounding countries that share those uh, elephant populations with Botswana to adopt a much and, more and that kind of coordination uh, response is interesting isn't it as international community looking at this though 
Uh, Charlie alluded to the American um, to come in ban, I think the Trump ban, of, it, of repatriating trophies. It was 2014. It's, it's been lifted now. So thank goodness uh, Americans are allowed to go back to Africa and suddenly well, the wildlife has got a value again. OK, well, uh, let me just throw that back to Mark, if I may, because the UK, I think, is keeping a watching brief. There was a paper put to the UK Parliament or parliamentarians oh, only a couple of months ago. Mm. Um, but they said we're not going to... Um, recommend a ban on repatriating carcasses and so on. Are you disappointed by moves like that? Would you encourage countries to think again? I am. Uh, the UK is uh, by no means uh, one of the largest importers, if you like, of trophies, one of the largest sources of trophy hunters that go across to Africa to shoot uh, threatened and endangered species and pay you know, uh, relatively large amounts of money to do so. And as we've said, uh, the US is by far the largest source of those kind of hunters. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think it would send a very uh, strong signal uh, internationally uh, if the UK were to introduce a ban and we've called for a ban initially, at least, on the import of trophies from threatened species. And these are yeah. species that are listed by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, the UN Convention. And that's there to try and ensure that trade, cross-border trade in animals and parts and products derived from mm. them, doesn't affect uh, uh, the conservation of species. And would that then um, provide a disincentive? to trophy hunters because you can't bring the trophy back and show it off to your friends it would and family. Provide an enormous incentive, but there already is. This is already in place. It's called CITES, and they uh, they have banned some uh, cross border trophies, and uh, and they are a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, they recently debated whether you should ban mammoth ivory, um, presumably not to protect the population of mammoths. Uh, but we are characterising this very much in terms of pest control at the moment. I mean, we, we keep talking about this. Uh, I, I, I would like to, uh, I would like Mark to move on to the the kind of the put and take side of hunting, which I, I will find much harder to mm. to argue with him. But you know, where people want to shoot lions, where people are breeding lions to be shot, I think that's probably the interesting point. I mean. You know, Rob has, Rob has already kind of hit on this, this you know, this rather British thing of we're always terribly worried about saving the village from the leopard. You know, the, 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 probably the kind of pressure point in hunting is the actual monetization of uh, wild animals, or in, as Mark would probably characterise it, tame animals that are released into the wild. But that's not trophy hunting. That's basically farming. I mean, that's like, well. you know, pig farming. We all eat... Well, some people have had kind of bacon sandwiches this morning. And so that means that someone else has had the pig in a confined space and then it's been taken to, the, to an abattoir. So this whole canned hunting is a separate issue to hopefully what we're talking about, which is about hunting and conservation and wildlife, because I would argue that canned hunting is nothing to do with wildlife conservation. Okay, yeah, so what, what he says, but it still comes under the same essential problem. What we're doing here is we're being rather pale and male and stale and sitting in Europe and telling people what to think in Africa. I, I chaired a um, a seminar in the European Parliament last week where ambassador after ambassador from the hunting countries of Southern Africa came and said, please stop telling us how to run our wildlife. You know, let us get on with it. And although I totally agree with Mark's ability and to an extent Rob's ability to kind of educate me out of my unfashionable views, where I get really worried is where Mark's influence through you know, the financial might of Born Free Foundation, he's able to change policy and actually legislate to stop that. I think Education is fine in this area, but legislation really doesn't work for me. I hate being bossed around. You shouldn't be bossing him around, Mark. How do you plead? First of all, I think uh, you know it's important to recognise that trophy hunting, what we're talking about here, people travelling you know, across countries and paying very large amounts of money to shoot um, iconic endangered animals in order to take a trophy home, uh, is not a traditional African activity, uh, by and large. This is something that was... That was exported to Africa from other parts of the world, if you like. It's a kind of throwback to a colonial uh, era, during which uh, many species of wild animals were shot and hunted almost to extinction. Uh, mm. The situation that we find tigers in so Asia, is... for instance, is largely a, a result of uh, completely unregulated, unmanaged and, and uh, awful uh, hunting uh, that went on uh, in, during colonial times, during colonial occupation. And you could say the same about some of the wildlife populations in parts of Africa as well. We so it's, it's very important not to characterise this as, as, as Westerners telling Africans what to do. Uh, this is Westerners telling other Westerners, if you like, what to do, um, well, because, or what not to do in this case. I mean, humans, ever since they arrived on Earth, have been pushing back wildlife for all kinds of reasons, whether it's for agriculture, uh, 
Some of it's been survival because the wildlife's actually coming from them, but mainly because of agriculture, because they needed to feed yeah. themselves. And a lot of this discussion is about alternative land uses, agriculture, forestry, uh, or for actually looking after the wildlife itself. And I still think we're having a conversation about Western people advising other Western people. And part of that mix has to be those people living out on the ground, local communities. So I do agree with you that... Uh, Sorry, you, Charlie, that the local communities are part of this discourse, but they do not have the media attention that we're getting here, three white males, uh, to discuss a lot of these issues. And I think that's such an important thing, which is not picked up by the media at all. Uh, and so we need to work a lot harder. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point for a time out and to bring our conversation for today to a close. Thank you very much indeed to all our guests. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.